Before I start, I want to point out, first of all, it might be a bit gloomy in here today because the weather's a bit rubbish. And also, I want to say thank you very much for the YouTube gathering. It was fantastic. Really felt at home. Really didn't feel like I was some old bloke hanging out with a lot of children, which was really the thing that really bothers me about this whole situation. Um, thanks for making me feel welcome. I found it really encouraging. If you make videos yourself, please go to a YouTube gathering because it's really encouraging. It's really great to compare notes and it makes you feel a lot less isolated. So that I just wanted to say that, but I obviously today is going to be mainly about the extraction of metals, which is on the IGCSE, AQA, and chemistry syllabus, and a lot of other syllabuses probably as well. So that's what I'm going to be going on mainly. I just wanted to start with that. Okay, so there is, I have done a video already on the reactivity series, which is here. So go there if you don't know about the reactivity series. The reactivity series is actually a bit artificial. It doesn't really exist, but it's one of the ways of understanding how some metals are generally more radio radioactive, reactive than others. Now, as far as the reactivity series is concerned, of course, the stuff over here, the stuff over here, the alkali metals and the alkali earths, can, are very active, therefore they hang on very strongly to the atoms that they're associated with and they're very difficult to extract using primitive technological methods. So the methods for extracting them is basically electrolysis. What you do is you find a salt that dissolves in water, you possibly acidify it a bit, you pass an electric current through it and that separates the components and you're going to end up with lithium building up on one side for example, or sodium building up on one side and the anion, which is probably going to be, a, might be a halogen, like chlorine or something like that, on the other side, and you separate them that way. That's not available in situations where the technology is quite primitive. So that's what you do with those. The next lot along are the transition metals mainly, which are this block in the middle. Now those, on the whole, they are sort of intermediate in reactivity between the alkali metals and the alkali earths, and the by the sort of noble metals which are sort of down here which are obviously still transition metals and they're often found in combination naturally in combination with sulfur or with oxygen for example hematite iron ore two atoms of iron per three atoms of oxygen another one is zinc blend zinc sulfide very common another one again is cinnabar which is mercury sulfide or a sulfide of mercury because i think there's more than one if you want to extract those what you do is you heat them with carbon or carbon monoxide. And because they are less keen on hanging onto their, on, onto their companion atoms than the carbon is, you end up with carbon dioxide, or you know carbon dioxide if you've got carbon monoxide in the first place, which then blows away because it's a gas, and you end up with a purer form of the metal. And that is how you extract that lot, and they're in the middle. And examples of that would be zinc, iron, tin, and lead. Now interestingly, all of that lot are the things that appear in alchemy and are familiar and are associated with the whole alchemical astrological system and associated with particular planets because those are the ones that were familiar in pre-modern times to people. So for example, you've got mercury, which is obviously associated with mercury, tin there, which is associated with Jupiter, uh, lead that's associated with Saturn and so forth. So you can see that they were around in ancient times and more recently because they could be extracted fairly easily. The next lot actually doesn't need extracting at all and that would include things like platinum, gold and silver. And that lot is often found in native form, it's actually found as is and that makes it a lot easier to get hold of. Now I need to talk about iron refining. Iron refining is done in a blast furnace. What you do is you get your hematite which is two atoms of iron with three of oxygen and you stick it in a furnace with coke and limestone and what happens is the coke combines with the coke which is carbon uh, combines with the iron oxide rips off the oxygen flies out the window and you end up with iron you probably end up with quite a lot of carbon in there as well and that is where I come to allies but alloys but I'm going to talk about that later so that's how iron is extracted in the blast furnace Iron obviously has been around in pure form other than meteorite form because it can't, meteorites are quite often made of iron or iron and nickel actually. Um, for thousands of years, about 3,000 years the Iron Age has been going on for now. 
and it started with the Hittites in about 1000 BC, but I'm going to talk about that later. It's not actually on the GCSE syllabus for chemistry at least, it might be on the history one, I'm not sure. Anyway, so that lot. Now the least reactive metal, which is actually extracted by electrolysis, is aluminium, which is what's known as a poor metal or a typical metal, because it's on this side of the periodic table. These are not transition metals. Transition metals form coloured compounds, are hard, tend to be dense, are resistant to corrosion and and are generally quite useful for structural purposes. Aluminium is not like that. Here is an example of aluminium. Now this has been extracted originally from bauxite probably, which is in the aluminium ore, by combination with cryolite and also an electrolysis system. Before that method was available, aluminium was actually a precious metal. At the top of the Washington Monument has an aluminium cap on it because it was considered to be a modern precious metal. And also Napoleon had aluminium, uh, well, I was going to say silverware, aluminium cutlery because it was worth more than silver at the time. So it was very ostentatious to have aluminium at that time. Nowadays it's as common as muck and actually probably quite dangerous as well because of the whole Alzheimer's connection, which I'm not going to talk about on here, but be careful with aluminium. Don't cook acidic things in it because it combines with acids quite easily and can be absorbed and it's not actually part of most biological systems. So now to talk about alloys. Aluminium, by the way, aluminium is easily recycled and it's actually cheaper energy-wise to recycle it than it is to provide, to extract it from bauxite. So aluminium recycling is very keen. I actually used to work for an aluminium recycler. So I know quite a lot about that, but it's really boring because that's what the jobs are like. Anyway, right, so then you've got the question of alloys. Now, oh yeah, sorry. Just the, that is the formula of the equation which enables you to illustrate how hematite, that's one iron ore, gets turned into iron. So, so you've got the three, two lots of iron and three of oxygen, uh, two lots of that, three lots of carbon, combine that together, heat it up, there should be heat under there or something, and you end up with four irons and three lots of carbon dioxide, which because that's a gas, will disappear. So that's how you get them. Now, if you look at an ordinary pure metal, you get an arrangement sort of like that, that's like one metal. So it's quite a regular arrangement of crystals and they can easily slip against each other. So that is one reason why metals tend to be quite soft. And again, suppose you've got another metal with different size atoms like that. Again, you've got that which you will end up with sheets basically of atoms which will slip over each other and therefore it'll be quite soft. One way to make it, one way to make it harder and more durable is to combine the two metals, the elements, and then you get that. Now when you get that, they're less likely to slip against each other because the atoms being different sizes mess up the crystal structure and they will tend to sort of be much more together like that. An example of that is stainless steel. Stainless steel is the combination of iron, chromium and nickel, which is resistant to corrosion to a greater extent than iron. Another form of steel is steel with carbon in it, Low carbon steel tends to be quite soft. Uh, high carbon steel tends to be harder, so it tends to be used for very durable substances. Now, I just also wanted to talk about, while I was here, talk about the Bronze Age. This is brass, not bronze. At the end of the Stone Age, people discovered that it was possible to combine tin and copper, and possibly also arsenic, uh, to form hard metals which could be molded quite easily when they were heated. So rather than just chipping bits off stone and able to get some sort of blade, but not particularly exactly what you wanted, they were then able to mold them and form them in particular forms by hammering them and by bending them and that sort of thing while they were still hot and soft. And then you end up with a very hard form, it being an alloy, like I said, of copper and tin, which is really useful. The only problem was that because that was the only metal they had, they weren't able easily to get hold of iron. There is native iron, it comes in the form of meteorites falling from the sky, but obviously it's quite rare. And so when they actually managed to extract iron, they sort of did it in probably a fire where they ended up mixing charcoal and some sort of iron ore and they discovered that they could get iron. This happened about 3,000 years ago and they were able to make much harder and sharper weapons. And as a result, they were able to have a technological advantage over the people around them. And hence the Bronze Age came to an end and Iron Age people conquered everything. The practice of smelting iron spread to the whole world eventually 
and that was it. Now, most people think the Iron Age was something that happened in the dim and distant past, but in fact, we are still in the Iron Age because the main structural material we still use in terms of metal is iron. Now, I'm looking forward to the Titanium Age, but unfortunately, this Iron Age is never ending. It just goes on and on and on, and it's like really, right, okay. So, um, that's a bit of a pity because I want everything to be made of titanium. It's really powerful, hard stuff, durable, light, fantastic stuff, but also really, really expensive because it's difficult to extract. Okay, so that's it for today. If you like this video, please rate, comment, share, and subscribe. If you dislike this video, please tell me why so I can improve. Don't forget my pregnancy channel. Um, if you know about the other channel, don't forget that either, although it's gonna be rather hard to forget. And um, I'll see you tomorrow.